Um, but COP26 just stands for the 26th conference of the parties. So the UN are bringing together almost every single country for a global climate summit. And it's happening right now in Glasgow. There's already been some pictures um, going out there. Some of the news articles are coming out already. The aims of COP26 this year are to secure a global net zero by the mid-century, um, adapt to protect communities and natural habitats, mobilise a billion dollars in climate finance and to work together to agree the Paris rulebook. Um, so this is what is happening in Glasgow. This is what our world leaders are discussing. Um, but we found that one thing they are maybe missing is the youth voice, which is why we have put together this debate event for you to really have your voice heard. So I'm now going to pass over to our youth council who are going to introduce themselves, um, the role they play at the FSC and to also just open a floor discussion as to why youth voice is important when we are talking about climate change and climate um, crisis. So youth council, over to you guys. Uh, hi, I am Finn. Um, I'm one of the members of the youth council. So there are 12 of us. We are environmentally conscious individuals who come together. Uh, we meet online via Zoom. Uh, and we act as a voice for the young people because um, we are still young-ish. Um, we're from 16 to 25 uh, and we discuss further ways to improve the engagement um, with other people around our age and how we can better reach us. Um, things we've done is we've helped set up social media pages, for example our Instagram, our TikTok, which I think there are links for in the chat. Um, we've also helped influence the content of uh, of the courses, programs and trips. Um, so yeah, over to Sophie. Hiya, I'm Sophie. Um, my day job is I'm a youth and young adult minister for the church, but I studied uh, international development and economics and like really focused on like natural resources at uni and just got a real interest. Um, so why the youth voice is important, I think, there are loads of reasons and a few of us have a few different things that we're going to say but i think it's really important because we have energy and we care and um we're passionate about it young people are really enthusiastic and that's something that older people always comment about younger people is that i'm a bit older than 25 but you guys are enthusiastic we're enthusiastic about it um and so that is one reason that we should totally be involved um fiona uh, yeah, so hi, I'm Fiona. Uh, I did zoology at um, the University of Sussex. And so, yeah, I always had a big interest in wildlife and stuff and was also a young Darwin scholar. I think apparently there's a few, <laughs> few of you here today. But uh, yeah, so wanted to join the Youth Council to kind of help, yeah, help make sure there's a real kind of youth focus in the work they're doing. Because, yeah, that's really important for climate and also for kind of biodiversity monitoring, It's which is a lot of what the FSC does, you know, making sure people have the skills to identify and record um, wildlife means that the citizen science can, yeah, can keep going on. Hi, I'm Anna. I'm currently still in college. I hope to study environmental science university and one day become a conservationist. I think, um, like many people in recent years, I was kind of woken up to the climate crisis and became very interested in it. And so, decided to really engage in it. And that's why I'm part of the Youth Council. For me, youth voice is really important because we talk about all these goals for like 2050, 2030, and these politicians who won't be in power then say, we're gonna do this by 2050. But the people who are gonna make it happen are us. So we have to be listened to because we are the people who are gonna bring this to reality. Perfect. Thank you so much, guys. Um, so that is something that we will discuss even in our open floor discussion. So for all of you who are not members of the Youth Council, there will be an opportunity after the debate for you to be able to make your voice heard. And if you want to just say why a youth voice is important, then you know that's something we can definitely discuss in the open floor discussion. So just a quick rundown of how the event will work. Um, so we are going to vote on the topic that we're going to debate. So we have set up a poll. So if you um, launch the poll. So if you can now vote on what you think the topic should be, um, this should be something that you would feel comfortable being for and against for. So you are going to be randomly allocated 
to one of these groups. So have a look at them, have a think, be like, could I convincingly debate this to say, yes, I am for, yes, I am against. You don't have to actually feel those ways, but you just need to be able to debate it confidently. You're obviously going to have time to talk together. You'll have time to research. You'll have time to do all sorts of things, but you need to feel confident that you, if you're putting either group, you can debate this. Um, so it's just, I think, few of you left to vote. Um, they're looking pretty even at the moment, but we'll leave it open a couple more minutes. And yes, as Dylan just said, these topics were pre-selected by our Youth Council after discussions over several environmental topics. So we had a whole bunch, um, but these were the two that we felt were probably the easiest to do for and against for for a majority of people. Okay, so I think we've just got two more people to vote. Okay, I think we've ended it there. So looks like we are debating the topic, is planting trees the best solution to climate change by one vote? Um, so that is decided. Great, very, um, a very debate style voting on things like that as well. Um, perfect, so we'll close that down. So now you have the opportunity to decide when we put you into the breakout rooms, whether you want to actually be part of the formalised debate. Um, we really recommend you get involved. This is a great opportunity to just get your voice out there and um, work with your peers, work with people similar to your age who share similar interests. So we would really like you to be involved in the debate, but if you do not feel comfortable, you are more than welcome to be in the audience instead. So we will randomly put you into breakout rooms. One will be for and one will be against. You you won't know which team you're in and um, Dylan and I will come in and tell you which team you're in. You'll then be given 15 minutes to research um, and then you need to assign four people out of your team just looking how many people in the group. So depending on how many of you would like to actively debate or how many of you would like to be in the audience we're going to ask for four people of your team to be the speakers. So you can all work together to build the debate, you can all work together to build your argument, but only four people are going to be the people actually presenting. Um, we'll then have the formal debate, which Ellie will describe how it will work in a moment, followed by an audience vote and then the open floor discussion. So Ellie, would you like to just briefly explain how the debate um, will actually happen, please? Yeah, sure. So um, as Beck said, we need four people per side um, ready to speak. So four for pro and four for against the motion. Um, and normally what we'll do is you kind of structure your debate across your speakers. So your first speaker would do kind of an introduction into your, your team's argument as a whole. You know, the key points that, that are going to be covered and maybe just start to go into those. Um, the, the very sort of early stages because of course we do kind of really want to want to keep to um I think we were saying five minutes per speaker if that's right bet yeah so five minutes per speaker so you want to make sure that you just introduce the topic introduce your stance on it and then you get into that potentially maybe the first point um and then you stop and then it will be the first speaker for the against team who, who would do of course exactly the same and the second speaker um, in each team will then start to get into the, you know, the really main points of the argument, go through those in a little bit more depth. And then we would expect a third speaker to kind of finish the main points off. And, um, and you know, so that they've set up the fourth speaker then for each team to be able to conclude and um, kind of wind up and summarise the key points uh, from that side. So um, the other thing that those later speakers can do, that speaker two, three and four, if they feel comfortable to, they can discuss as well the points raised by the other team. So if, for example, the other team have said, um, you know, the really good thing about building, uh, about planting more trees is that it's a really tangible impact that people can see. And you were in the uh, against team, you might say, actually, you know, there's plenty more tangible things we can do. And there's lots of different ways to make an impact and you can talk a little bit about those so you can almost engage directly with the arguments made by the other team um but the the critical thing is just to break your content up across all four speakers first of all so that everybody gets to make um you know the, some some points of their own and that you're not just repeating each other's points but also because that way you kind of structure the discussion so make sure you introduce it give a clue to what's going to be said and then as we pass down the line 
hopefully we'll, we'll hear that get built on until we get to the conclusion. And then, um, as, as Beck said, there'll be a winner to the debate and there will be, I believe, an audience vote to help determine that winner as well. Perfect. Thank you so much for that, Ellie. So obviously you're all going to be part of the audience. You're all going to get to vote. Um, so we're going to ask you to be very, very honest people um, and vote for the team that you do feel um, portrayed their point much clearer they you know gave the best examples etc so even if you were part of four team and you think against team actually did better that's fine vote for against team um we want a clear um nice honest debate to happen so we're now going to attempt to put you into breakout rooms um and we're really hoping this works <laughs> um so if you would not like to be part of the formalized debate and would rather just be in the audience please click do not enter breakout room if you are happy to be part of the debate, um, you don't have to be the speaker, obviously. You can just go to the breakout room and chat through the ideas. Um, you don't have to be the speaker. I would recommend joining the breakout room. Um, but hopefully this is going to work. Um, start recording. Hello, everybody. Welcome back from your breakout room excursion. Um, if you are all comfortable and happy, um, we will move on to the formal debate section. So I will pass over to Ellie, who is going to chair the debate for us um, as a professional debater. So hopefully she is in the room, there she is. Um, so Ellie, over to you, if you just wanna briefly again explain um, what the um, what they all need to do, and then we will get started. Yep, so what we'll do is just um, follow the structure I mentioned earlier. So we'll have the first speaker speak from each side and then the second speaker from each side and so on, all the way down to the fourth speaker. And if you can try and stick to five minutes or less each, then that gives us plenty of time for free discussion at the end. So that would be brilliant. Um, and I will just let you know which speakers do next, just so if you happen to um, zone out or anything else happens to happen to your connection or anything like that, then you should know when it's your, your time to speak. Um, so then without any further ado, is the first speaker for the for the motion, i.e. That, that thinks that, what is that means the motion, hold on, um, that planting trees is the best solution to climate change available at the moment. The first speaker, planting trees is great. I'll hand over to you. Um, we think that planting trees is the best solution for climate change because, well, for a whole host of reasons, but um, first of all, we thought it was really important that at the beginning of COP, one of the first things that we heard on the news was that um, 100 countries representing 85% of forested lands have signed up to end um, deforestation by 2030. So it's one of the first things they've decided. They clearly think it's really important. Um, and it is really important, but actually we think that stopping deforesta deforestation alone is not enough. Uh, we also need to be raising awareness. We need to, um, so, well, we need to be raising awareness, but trees are really helpful in raising awareness. Trees are Someone pointed out earlier, they're a really tangible thing. It was the first thing that was said before our de debate even happened. Someone said that actually trees being there is really good. Um, and it's a really like tangible, you can see um, the trees and therefore you can see our response. And it's a bit of an indicator for other people to go on and um, do something in their own lives. Um, but we also think that they're really good for CO2 retention. They clearly are. Um, we plant trees, lots of the um, apps and things that you can come across to um, repay your carbon. My brain's gone a bit blank for the word. Um, but when you um, pay your energy bill, you can pay a bit more to carbon offset. That's the word. Um, and trees are one of the ways that carbon offsetting happens. And we think that's really important. Um, just looking at my notes. Um, Trees are also really good for biodiversity. Um, so not only are we looking to minimise um, the climate change, the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere, but by doing that, by um, planting trees, as opposed to other things, we're increasing biodiversity and increasing biodiversity is good for 
all sorts of things and it's not just for the climate it's um for our world and for our health in general it's so much better but we'll explore that more in a mo and our third major point is about mental health and um, being outside being amongst trees being in nature is really good for our mental health and we can only do well um in fighting climate change if our mental health is good and therefore planting trees is a really great way of doing that so there are arguments that we'll um check out a bit more um later sorry i was stuck on mute um yeah that, that's that's brilliant thank you so that's our first speaker for, for the motion uh that trees are the best way to combat climate change who is our first speaker against the motion uh that's me okay. um, yes so we obviously say that trees aren't the best way um to to tackle climate change um and whilst we think they're good we think there that there are better ways um so uh, for example um trees take quite take up quite a lot of space on land so in a country like the uk where we've got quite high relative population density there isn't much space um so what we'd look for is um, an alternative such as the ocean um, and seagrass meadows which you do get in britain and all around the world as well um, are much better than any terrestrial forest um, at sequestering carbon um, so some statistics here that uh, they take up 0.2 percent of the world's ocean space but they sequester approximately 10 percent of the carbon buried each year and that's obviously a huge benefit for the amount of well unused space that we'd be um that they take up and seagrass meadows are great so you can obviously fish on top of them um you can do other things on top of them um like recreation and um yeah so they're providing food as well as sequestering carbon um and also as compared to forests where most of the carbon is stored in the trees uh in seagrass meadows most of this carbon is stored in the sediment so it'll last longer and is more of a long-term solution than having to maintain the forest and the old stand growth um, permanently. So when they say that trees um, are sequestering so much per year, that's when they're growing. But once it's got to the, the full ecosystem, it then takes less of that carbon's gonna stay in the soil as compared to seagrass meadows. Um, so blue carbon, which is what we're talking about um, and water-based ecosystems is a really good place um, to deal with uh as an alternative to tree planting um to sequester carbon um what else um so and even in the open ocean where things like 50 percent of the world's carbon is sequestered by phytoplankton um on a huge area that you can plant trees you can do most things because it's so far away from where we live um but it would still on a planetary scale be useful um if we could do blue carbon rather than um on land carbon uh i think that was the point i was going to take so thank you okay thank you so then our second speaker before is going to take us a little bit more into into the arguments that sophie introduced who are you mystery speaker hello that's me sorry Hi. my screen will be blank um as i don't feel too good today but um i just wanted to go into some of the points that were previously mentioned so we're thinking about raising awareness so as you probably already know, we are a growing population. We aren't going to be getting any smaller. And so in urban areas and things like streets and cities, we're going to need more trees in order to raise awareness on ecosystem services, um, ecosystems in general, environmental issues and everything like that. And by having trees present, they're quite a big and substantial thing as um, actually the counter um, argument was just made. You know, there are, they are quite big. Um, so they're quite easy to identify. They're easy to identify from a young age. They're easy to identify as you get older. Um, I'm sure a lot of you remember doing like bark colouring and things like that when you were a kid. And so it's a really easy way to engage young minds. Um, we've also got some um, other points about CO2 retention and how, um, and like, um, I cannot say the word, sequestration. Sequestration? There we go. Um, so obviously a lot of carbon is held within trees. Um, they're really important for other ecosystem services as well, such as producing um, oxygen. Um, they're really good for flood management and everything like that. 
they're really brilliant obviously as we just know we went through the COVID-19 pandemic um, and I'm sure a lot of you as you previously mentioned probably had at least one or two issues regarding like your mental health and so going out into nature and seeing trees in sort of every environment you go into it's it's really refreshing and it, it can do wonders for you and your health um, and then we also had the argument regarding biodiversity so in regards to biodiversity with the right amount of trees in an area you can have a really flourishing ecosystem that can grow and evolve and change and host a wide range of organisms um, that can really help with other ecosystem services that can aid in the fight for climate change as well. So they're really sort of substantial for every environment, in our opinion. Um, and yeah, that's sort of the more in-depth side of the argument that I wanted to go into. Um, thank you for listening. Okay, thank you. That was uh, brilliant. Perhaps someone would like to build on uh, Magnus's ex excellent points as the second speaker for the against the motion. Hi, yeah, so um, yeah, the kind of bit I was going to cover was the um, idea of uh, greenwashing um, and how it can be a problem if you're planting trees to carbon offset. Does that stop companies then taking responsibility and actually reducing their carbon emissions if they're then just going to go and plant trees? And if that actually is them kind of offloading the problem to we're not going to reduce our emissions, we're just going to throw money at a tree planting um, organisation. Um, and then also, if the main um, aim and the main focus is on planting trees, then sometimes, you know, it can happen that you know trees get planted and there's not actually any proper maintenance towards it. And so you're planting them and they're maybe not being watered and not being looked after. And so they might say, you know, 50 trees have been planted, but if they're not being properly cared for, then you're not actually continuing to sequester the um, carbon. And also it can be um, if you have the wrong types of trees. So if it's just like any tree will sequester carbon, which is true, but you're planting, you know, lots of non-native conifers or whatever, then you're not actually producing, you know, the best value for biodiversity and for the environment. And there's another problem, which is if your main focus, if the big kind of goal is that trees are there for ecosystem services, there's kind of been that kind of devalues nature in a way. If you're just purely looking at it as, you know, kind of what it can give to us in, in terms of ecosystem services, then the moment we maybe develop new technology that could remove carbon by itself, we'll be like, OK, we don't need the trees anymore because we were purely using them for the goal of extracting carbon. Um, and then also it's if we're only focusing on planting trees and not developing, you know, fully biodiverse woodland with the kind of ground cover and stuff needed, then yeah, then that's a kind of biodiversity loss if you're just having plantations, straight plantations of trees. So yeah, if it, it can be done in the wrong way, then it won't have the best impacts for biodiversity. Yeah, that, that's me. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so lots of interesting points raised there. Um, so who is going to take this one on from the full camp? I am. Um, so um, it's interesting we're talking about like biodiversity and how, you know, these plantations of trees aren't encouraging biodiversity. And I would agree with you, just having a plantation of trees is not going to encourage biodiversity. But if you want to create a biodiverse ecosystem, that's going to have to start with planting trees, particularly forest ecosystems, obviously, you know, we talk about rewilding all these these other species and stuff but before we do any of that before we restore these ecosystems we need trees first you know they're kind of the the building blocks of these ecosystems so we plant trees and then eventually we'll see other species start to colonize that area and hopefully eventually we'll reach a point where we have a independent ecosystem that won't need management by humans. Of course, until we reach that point, we will need management of those ecosystems. And also another point that was made was that planting uh, seagrass in oceans and ocean environments might be better for carbon capture. Um, yes, that's true. But if we're planting stuff in an ocean, number one, that's going to be much more difficult for conservationists or um, scientists to do you know we're going to need the equipment to go and plant things in the ocean whereas planting trees is much easier it can even be accessible to an average person you know 
all of us could go out and plant a tree if we had one in our garden you know if there's a project going on in the local park that's something we can do so planting trees and forest ecosystems are much much more accessible for the average person which will raise more awareness for the climate crisis in general so therefore the trees might not have as big an effect as your ocean ecosystems you're talking about but it will because people will be more connected to nature and they'll want to protect it and they'll want to protect our ecosystems thank you okay a brilliant counter there so back to uh, the against camp to hear what, what they have to say on the matter um so okay so uh first thing i want to say is um trees definitely are not the first step in ecosystems um firstly you need pioneer species um you need things like fungus uh, fungi um you need mosses grasses um trees cannot survive on their own at all um there's definite uh and they do come after uh, other things and um also you can't just plant trees and expect other things to come you need to actively um aid the re like um the introduction of biodiversity again um also an uh, an earlier point was uh, mental health trees um improve mental health yes they do but they're not the only um plants or animals that um they're not the only organisms that improve mental health uh running around in a meadow that can you know um there's literally the phrase skipping in the daisies being happy because you know that sort of thing it, um it's great for your mental health as well um as would uh say seagrass meadows or you know great marine wildlife um things like that um also um uh another point that we would uh have is that it's really expensive to plant trees it's very costly um and not just planting trees maintaining them keeping them up um and making sure that they survive um because if you're not looking after them um they will die and that's wasted money um there's also the, uh, often the trees are wrapped in plastic importing these trees from other countries can be um can have a huge negative impact um because obviously that's uh, emissions um and also just planting the wrong type of trees it, it um is awful for biodiversity um there's also planting on top of other habitats and destroying them uh, is a serious problem um for example uh peat bogs are extremely important for carbon capture and as carbon sinks um and if you plant trees on top of that that can just degrade the bogs and just um release so much carbon um that they can have a negative impact um there's also so many hidden costs because for a start that land could have been used for something else for um maybe for the local people's livelihoods um maybe they need the land for farming um and yes you might be buying the land from them so you initially give them a bit of money but that's not going to cover um the cost of losing that land um there's also things like um when the uh for example in canada they have huge um they have a huge problem with parasites just storming through their forests um that they planted and coping with that um and things like wildfires that can happen due to just um dense tree plantations if you're just focusing on planting these trees that um it is so expensive to plant them it costs um around uh 200 quid to um 200 pounds to plant a new tree and um properly like a sapling not just a seed um and that's just to start and that is far more expensive than other methods thank you thank you so that that brings us to our final speaker for the motion oh uh, yeah that's for me, for me to do i think um so i am supposedly concluding the four argument and there's been sort of four main points raised essentially for the argument of uh planting trees being the best solution to climate change uh we've got mental health and awareness raising attitude affecting uh, factors to consider 
Um, so essentially, uh, mentalities can be improved by having trees planted. And um, then we've got the direct effects on the ecosystems that trees can have on perhaps soil quality, air, air pollution and air quality. And um, the uh, key stain species sort of um, uh, position in the ecosystem on biodiversity. Uh, and then we've got the last point, which is, I don't know, I think that's it actually. That's that's our four main points sort of summed up into one conclusion. That's, that's me done, thank you. Thank you. So our final speaker then is the final against speaker. Hello. Uh, so our final point is that um, if uh, planting trees is the best solution, people are just going to presume that, oh, I can carry on with my everyday life, lifestyle, livelihood and just plant a tree and everything will be better that's wrong, that's not going to make a difference. Uh, planting trees is not enough to counteract um, our consumption um, and it's never going to be enough at the rate we plant trees and the rate we're consuming um, solely planting trees alone will not uh, make a difference that we need. We need to change our livelihoods or come up with a better solution. Um, planting trees alone, their benefits or the peak benefits are reaped in the future. So when the trees are um, more mature, they um, sequest, sequester more um, carbon dioxide. However, that's in the future and that's in 10 years time and we cannot wait till then. We don't have time to waste. This time could be spent doing something else such as water-based ecosystems, which grow a lot quicker and as we've proved um, are more effective. Um, another point we've raised is the location at which we are planting the, the trees. Uh, we might be planting over um, habitats which are more important such as uh, peat bogs or habitats which aren't well suited to uh, trees or natural trees. Um, so then that's a waste of money. Um, and what about instead of continuing to plant trees, why don't we just protect what we've got and stop wasting um, our money? So, yeah, we don't believe that solely planting trees is going to solve our issue. Thank you. Thank you. So that, that's all of our speakers. And uh, the first thing I would say is that some of you should definitely consider doing more debating and public speaking because you deliver, deliver very well. So um, that's always a good start. Are we going to run a poll back for to work out who, who our debate winner is? Yep, so Dylan should now be launching a poll. Um, you can vote either way. So if you were in the four team and you think the against team did the best, please vote for them. Um, Obviously, you will want yourself to win, but vote for who you think was the most convincing and who you think, if they were at COP26, people might actually listen to. Like, that's what we're going for here. Okay. And well done to everyone as well, because I know you yes. didn't get to choose what side you were speaking on, and that can sometimes be tough to end up um, arguing something that you might not have chosen yourself. But I think... You know, it's always a good skill to understand both sides of, of an argument and you kind of you can never truly convince other people if you don't understand where they're coming from so i think it's always useful to um try considering both sides of the argument definitely i think you all did amazing um and yeah as ellie said we didn't want to put you where you wanted to go and um, the point of this was to put you somewhere else um and to get you to discuss but as you can see from our poll the against team has won so congratulations against team um you guys did amazing but 14 you were equally as amazing i think you all for your first time debating i think you all did an incredible job um so now we would really like to open um oh here we go 
Um, what do you really think? We'd love to know what you actually think. Do you actually think tr planting trees to tackle climate change is the best solution or do you think it's not? But well done everyone, you did do an amazing job. It was great to hear all sides. Okay, interesting. So some votes coming in here. Um, and I think maybe what we could kickstart these open floor discussions with is this topic, is this question again? So you've done your formalised debate where you were putting your own sides. Um, we just had it finished. So four of you voted, yes, it is the best way um, that you were for planting trees to have climate change and nine of you voted again. So I think opening a floor discussion, I'm going to hand over to our youth council members to host this. Um, but it'd be really great for everybody who is here to get involved in a conversation about why you do or don't think this. Um, anything else that is being discussed at COP26, anything else regards to climate change and youth voice, this is your time now to really get your voice heard. Um, these things will be going out on social media. Um, so this is your opportunity. But yes, if you would like to now open up to the floor discussions and if anyone has any questions um, that they would like to ask, then please ask them to each other, have a chat with each other. This is your time. So Youth Council, if you could take over the hosting reins, um, we'll pass over to you sure. now. Um, uh, I might just get us started by saying that I don't think it's a simple question of yes or no. Um, is it good or is it bad? I think we definitely need to plant some trees, but there, it, we can't have one, there's not one size fits all. It's not one solution. There are so many things that we need to be doing. Um, and I think focusing on one thing is not going to help anyone. Um, does anybody have any countering points for that? Yeah, no, I definitely agree with that, that it's like various, like, you know, you can have both. You can plant seagrass and plant other ones. I think something that came across in kind of both the for and against is that it's the method is really important so that if you are planting trees, you're doing it in a way that also, you know, enhances biodiversity and also is, you know, the most, the cheapest and not building, planting on land where they're not going to thrive and stuff. So it's, but I think there is a danger at the moment, you know, where there was the whole like Mr. Beast thing where it's like plant a million trees or whatever. But if it's just the numbers and there's not, not much thought going into how that's delivered, then yeah, then that can cause issues. There's quite a big topic that's coming up is biodiversity um, and how linked do people think that is to climate change are they two separate things as anybody um, specifically non-youth council um, have any of you got any points on that so I'm sort of thinking out loud here but um, I think this aspect of diversity is, is sort of like a work in progress, essentially. I think people are still realising how important diversity is. And like I'm currently studying invasive species and such. That's asking me to look into the native species aspects. And um, it's essentially like diversity is a big, big part of it, but it's it's not the be all and end all, but it is, it is basically nature. So. I was going to mention as well about um, how the question sort of said, are you for trees, like planted trees, to tackle climate change rather than it being the best thing? I am definitely for it, but um, not necessarily saying that it's the best thing. Yeah, definitely. I think we can be for multiple things. We don't need, there is no point in, my, in my opinion is that there's no point ranking which solution is better than another it's just that we stop talking and start acting and start taking part in these solutions and carrying them out um yeah I, I think another interesting thing is when we talk about biodiversity is we often say you know tropical coral reefs tropical rainforests these are like the most important ecosystems because they are the most biodiverse but in doing that people go oh yeah tropical coral reefs are more important than um, mangroves or seagrass meadows and the reality is is that every single ecosystem that is on earth needs to be protected equally you know tropical rainforests might have more biodiversity but if we only have tropical rainforests you know globally we won't have as much biodiversity so we need a little bit of everything 
and just putting value on the biodiversity of an ecosystem will stop us from seeing the true value of that ecosystem. Yeah, and I think there's almost, I feel like there's a sense in which we undervalue, especially our kind of British ecosystems. And I'm going to bring in HS2 now, which I wanted to do in the debate, but didn't get around to. But yeah, where people are kind of horrified to hear the rates of destruction in tropical rainforests, obviously rightly but then kind of people not getting as angry as I would expect. They're not being such a wide kind of uproar about the fact that, you know, ancient woodland has been around for thousands of years is, is being destroyed for HS2 kind of in the name of progress. And especially when our government is saying that putting tree planting and protecting trees and saying that's a priority in COP26 while also destroying ancient woodland. <laughs> it's yeah, quite interesting. I think that's really interesting because I think it's kind of related to what we're uh, exposed to. So people who are maybe less exposed to our natural environment um, probably care a little bit less about it. And it's easier to like jump on the bandwagon of what social media or what whatever you're following, whatever you see, come whatever comes in your emails, whatever you're learning about at school. It's a lot easier to follow that. Um, but if you look at what three degrees or two degrees even of sea level rise will mean, I used to live in Norfolk, um, what it means in the broads, the effect that will have on some of the insects and actually the biodiversity there will be hugely affected just because of the, um, because, literally because of a temperature increase or a sea level rise and the effect of that on the insects. But um, yeah, I think as we, or particularly as urban people, um, I've lived in urban environments for the last few years, but as urban people, we don't necessarily engage so well with the natural environment. And when you engage less well, I think it's less easy to be passionate about it. Uh, I, there you go. Thanks. And so Anna's point about uh, values on an ecosystem, I, I'm a big fan of seeing the earth as a like a system in itself, like a large system, like a Gaia theory that has a body sort of thing in itself. So I think we have to sort of manage manage the earth as a system as a whole, but also value it and like recognize its different efforts required for different biomes, essentially, not necessarily putting value on the the biomes, but uh, recognizing that they require different efforts to manage them. Um, then I had a point for what Fiona said, but I forgot, sorry. Charlotte said in our chat, we're often told that biodiversity is so important when it's just one factor of a functioning ecosystem. So many people believe the more bio biodiverse an ecosystem is, the better it is, but that's not necessarily true. That's, yeah, that's a, a very, really good very good point. Because <laughs> yeah, you know, some ecosystems that are like, you know, harsher and stuff, they're still, like you said, still really important, but then they won't necessarily be as biodiverse. Kind of reminds me of um, people's, I uh, sometimes think that, you know, how you measure an endangered species is just by, okay, there aren't many of them, but you do get species that are like naturally scarce. So they'll only be like naturally, maybe like a hundred individuals, but they're not actually endangered because that's just, you know, the natural size of their population. Obviously means they're more vulnerable to then like habitat loss and stuff, but that, you know, there don't need to be loads of something for it to be valuable for that to be. It's kind of right. <laughs> the flip side is true remember what I was going to say uh, about uh, so Fiona mentioned something about forests being thousands of years old I think the trees themselves can be thousands of years old but the actual system can be millions of years old and so I think like anthropogenically we can be like humans can be affecting like ecosystems as a whole which is sounds dangerous but then the earth is prone to disturbances again uh, relating back to the management aspect of the earth system that's uh, something that we really have as a problem is our anthropocentric view. You now, seeing everything think through the lenses of what our eyes, it's impossible not to, but you know, seeing us as the centre and we're not. Um, and we really need to realise that fact and get that we're not the centre of the earth. Yeah, and kind of building on that. Um, oh, sorry. But we have an like, an effect on, on the earth system so we can generally manage at least our effect on the earth system. Um, Charlotte has put in the chat, I feel we should be focusing on how an ecosystem functions and what works best on uh, what works best on a case by case basis uh, for the ecosystem and not for us. 
rather than just wanting more biodiversity. Really interesting point. I think um, there's a lot in um, like indigenous knowledge and that sort of thing that um, really kind of focuses on the um, best for the whole ecosystem and actually what's best for the whole ecosystem is best for a community and maybe as we've become a more developed society we've kind of moved away from that that knowledge of our ecosystems um, and yeah moved away from that uh, like and moved towards oh, exactly. just wanting biodiversity in a slightly like uninformed way. Yeah, I think it's it's also important when we think of biodiversity, it's just kind of the amount of species in an environment. And that kind of doesn't take into account either. There are some species that have really huge ecological value, like keystone species, for example. You know, all these other species rely on these keystone species. And so just saying, oh, we've got loads of species, that's great. But have you got elephants which support all of these other species? Have you got um, predators that keep all the other species in check so that the ecosystem is balanced. I think that the word biodiversity is kind of a tricky, it's a tricky word because it can mean a lot of different things and it can also be too narrow a view at the same time. And it's also used quite um, easily by companies um, and things just as, you know, uh, uh, as like a cash word, you know, this, they can just cash in on it by saying, oh, this place is biodiverse, we're doing amazing. Even though, um, as Charlotte said earlier, just because it's biodiverse doesn't mean it's good. I think Charlotte's got another point, which is you can be biodiverse and not have a functioning ecosystem. A lot of the time focus is put on the former rather than the latter. Yeah, and I was actually kind of in the middle of the debate, but it was like after I'd said my bit, so I couldn't um, put this in. But um, especially in the UK, like I was just relating to the like functioning ecosystem, but because we don't have any top predators at the moment, we've got a massive, as I'm sure you know, like a massive overabundance of deer, and that causes like overgrazing and is preventing reforestation happening naturally. So actually, you know, putting in better controls of deer by ideally by re reintroducing lengths, that would be the best way. But also means that at the moment, that's an added cost to re to the tree planting and stuff is that you have to have the deer proof fences and things. So yes, yeah, kind of what other people were saying about making sure it's a functioning ecosystem and then we then we don't have to do as much expensive management. So I was just going to reinforce what Charlotte said about yeah, focusing on the former rather than the latter and say so that's what came across diversity rather than biodiversity as a, as a thing and like uh, it just points out to me that individuals, animals themselves can be diverse in behaviour, for example, and rather than just like species richness and stuff like that. Yeah. It's quite so, yeah, I, say, I think there's a focus with biodiversity here, obviously, on the fact that it's talked a lot about more biodiversity, about more species, but biodiversity doesn't have to be more species, it has to be diversity of species. So as long as you've got a few different species to keep the ecosystem, the environment sort of varied, then that's what it needs to be rather than just more of everything. Yeah, I, I agree because, um, you know, in the UK, we don't necessarily have, a, well, we do have a lack of biodiversity, but we do have a lot of species, but what we are lacking is predators. Um, we don't we don't really have predators because we killed off you know our, our wolves and our lynx and of course that's quite a controversial topic reintroduction of wolves and lynx but it is a fact that our ecosystem the food chain isn't functioning because we only really have these herbivores that just eat on our trees which also you know stops us from being re able to replant trees whenever you replant trees you see them with these tree guards on in nature trees don't need tree guards because there aren't too many um, herbivores eating at them. So yeah, if we're planting trees, we also need to think about what e the ecosystem that supports those trees as well. So it's like we're changing ecosystems. Um, so, so it's like we're designing new new ecosystems from from, the, from what we've you know been disturbing it with, like, from what we've exactly. got. Exactly. We we need to you know change our behavior not the ecosystems um dylan has put in the chat 
what changes and decisions would you like to see come out of COP26? Um, at the moment, the main message is they want to stop deforestation by 2030, but there is still seven days to go. Who knows what else they should, they'll decide? I think I want them to sort of try and decide, like um, realise what kind of ecosystem we want to actually develop, because it's quite obvious that we have an effect over the design. I'd really like them to talk about emissions more. I mean, we always talk about emissions, but um, a lot of when we talk about emissions is it's manipulated. Um, for example, I am really against uh, flying as a concept. I think that it's one of the most destructive activities we do in terms of emissions. Obviously, other things like driving cars overall are worse, but as an individual, when you fly, that is probably the biggest part of your carbon footprint. So I'd quite like the, to see them talking about getting rid of um, internal flights. Like we shouldn't have flights from like Southampton to um, Manchester that you can you can take a train. I would slightly counter that with, um, yeah, I mean, obviously, like the fact that they've just like reduced the duty on domestic flights is ridiculous and stuff. But also at the moment, I felt they couldn't do that without um, reducing the prices on trains just because they are so expensive at the moment. And, you know, not everyone has access to a car. And so if you're then like just took away internal flights like completely and didn't reduce the prices of trains, then that would, you know, maybe prevent people seeing their families or whatever. So it's just making sure you do it in a way that isn't, um, yeah, isn't harming people. <laughs> Some more points from Charlotte. Um, there was also the discussion of plant awareness recently in the niche by BES and uh, how because we rely on technological advancements, we've lost a lot of our roots. This means that people are less confident to talk about things like plant identification and knowledge. So a lot of the times um, saying things like we'll plant more trees is an easier way of building confidence in people um, because you can easily identify them compared to, say, moss. Um, also, I honestly wanted uh, want to stop seeing governmental organisations having these large discussions, conferences, co conferences, where, yeah, oh, whatever, summits um, without any action. It feels like a front and that nothing is getting solved. Um, that is really true. Um, really difficult seeing these things and then having no follow through. Um, I think COP26 is going to be a, be a real um, check on, you know, people, right, you're not sticking to this part of Paris and clarifying it and saying, right, you need to change this. You haven't done what you said you would do. And I think it's good that countries and nations are brought to account for the things that they haven't done that they should be doing. I've noticed a couple of the things said in the comments just now were sort of related to a couple of statements made earlier on by a couple other people. Uh, I wanted to mention also about how the idea of systems collapse and relating back to the um, effect of like CO2 emissions on flights and cars and such. I think like so Siberia and like the methane being emitted from certain um, land masses comes to mind, but um, some of the effects of like ecosystems polluting can be more dramatic than any of the anthropogenic, I think struggle with this word, um, effects that we have. So uh, I think we need to sort of realise like, and like put forward like forcefully, like a bit more forcefully, but, uh, the, the dramatic effect of um, it's like ecosystems collapsing, essentially, like in some of the recent Attenborough documentaries. Thanks. It's pretty drastic. It's not quite so like biodiversity related, but one of the things I'd love to see from COP26 is, um, so a decade ago, some of the global um, North said that they would like, or they would put forward a hundred billion pounds towards, uh, for climate finance, so that people um, in the global South are able to develop in a way that is better for our planet. And they haven't done that. They haven't made the hundred billion yet. And we need to see them at least making up that hundred billion. And I'd really ideally love to see it doubled to 200 billion. I know that's like, 
bit crazy, but that is something that I would absolutely love to be seeing at the COP26 summit. What does the money go towards? Um, so climate finance, so any sort of like un or like less basically development, but in a more sustainable manner. Um, um, yeah, so R and D. Sorry. Research and development. Um, yeah. Also um, helping. It's easy for us to change and um, uh, you know use re renewables because we have the money as a rich nation to build the infrastructure, but it's not fair to impose those restrictions on nations that haven't got the money to build that infrastructure. And also because carbon, um, you know, using carbon is a much cheaper source of energy. And if you're saying, no, you can't do that anymore to poorer nations, they don't have, they can't um, develop because they can't get the energy because it's too expensive. Um, and it, it's really expensive to, you know, build the infrastructure. So we're giving, we're giving, uh, we're raising that money. Um, to help them build the infrastructure needed to develop sustainably. It's essentially a grant to say, okay, here's some money so that you can make this choice, um, which is a choice that we think you should be making, but you can't necessarily afford to make on your own. So we want to enable that to happen. I hadn't heard of that really, like, or realised like how that was working before, but that kind of makes so much sense because obviously what we're having to do now as a developed nation is, you know, it's the stuff with the like insulate Britain protests where it's now it's going back, hopefully, and retroactively putting insulation in, whereas if there's all these buildings happening, obviously in warmer climates wouldn't be insulation, but, you know, cooling things, making sure, you know, buildings are able to be built in a sustainable way and stuff mm -hmm. like that. So when all this progress is happening, it's it's moving in a sustainable direction which just makes so much sense and like you said should be this big priority but enforcing the importance of sustainability yeah mm. it's really interesting um w w w f w w f yeah have a carbon footprint tracker that you can track your footprint and you can see how big your footprint is and i think the uk average is either 12.6 or 13.6 tons per year and the global average is five tons so we're actually producing like way above per person the global average and some people are literally only producing like a ton two tons a year and that is from you know burning wood and living really really sustainable lives and we're telling them that they need to change but actually it's something that we need to change and we're the ones with the money and we're the ones who need to be committing to it and we're the ones who've put the carbon in the atmosphere we're the ones who've developed sooner and we're not the ones who are seeing the biggest impact so i'd really love to see those who are suffering the biggest impacts actually being thought of at cop 26. yeah i think there is there's a lot of hypocrisy in that if you if you search like most sustainable country in the world, it comes up with places like, you know, Switzerland, Scandinavian countries, the UK even. And it's like these are the most like sustainable countries in the world, the most environmentally friendly countries in the world. And I mean, yes, we're doing a lot for climate change, but the UK, we were like the start of the Industrial Revolution. We, we made this problem. Um, and yet you're calling us the most sustainable countries in the world. The most sustainable countries in the world aren't the places that are having to bring in loads of legislation to be sustainable. They're the places that already live sustainable lives. Mm -hmm. Bhutan so, as a country are actually carbon negative. Like, can you, and Bhutan, it, it's not Switzerland. It's not like one of the, like, it's not Sweden or Finland or somewhere like that. It's Bhutan, like we need to be up. That's amazing. We Isn't Bhutan, Bhutan the one? that like gave kind of human rights to like like rivers and stuff or maybe that was a different country but maybe actually that's a really interesting point and um, lots of the countries that are from like the global south talk about um the earth as like mother earth and that sort of thing and i think it is a different sort of relationship like we um it kind of goes back to ecosystem services i think but like the idea of like we we see what we can get from the earth whereas they completely see it as like mother earth that kind of idea of nurturing i think that's really interesting as well yeah it's and a, i think i'm oh, sorry do you want to go sorry it's just that um it's more of a fundamental problem we shouldn't have to bring in laws and stuff to protect our planet we should we need to educate people who are growing up now look this is nature look how amazing um it is we uh, we need to be appreciative of this um, and you know we need to be more at one with nature if you know what I mean um, and respect it 
yeah and also when we look at you know some countries you know in developing countries that might not be as sustainable a lot of the time that actually came from mainly british colonization like in kenya and stuff where we kind of came in and, and there was a very kind of you know reciprocal respectful relationship with the land before there and you know we came in and actively like destroyed their language destroyed their storytelling and like folklore systems so they no longer had that basis for kind of having that connection to the land there's actually um a story that i don't know if you know wangari matai she's like she's amazing if you don't know about her she's a kenyan environmentalist did lots of stuff on lots of environmental um activism and stuff but, you know she said that uh so when she was younger there was this tree that um was there was a particular type of species of tree that was kind of believed to have a spirit in it and so that was completely protected um, and then obviously when the British government came in and just, you know, destroyed the kind of folklore, that tree then got cut down, but its root system had actually been protecting a stream, which then completely dried up. So it's almost like that folk knowledge was protecting a whole ecosystem. And then when that was taken away, it had the kind of knock on effects, just slightly off topic, but <laughs> it's, it's really interesting. Oh, sorry. Cor correlates with disturbances and like, <laughs> We googled the definition of disturbance and it's, it literally means stirring so it's like this idea of stirring like context like stories and the other point i was going to say about earlier on about what sophie was talking about the funding i'd like to see that going towards more like larger scale stuff like ecosystem collapse and stuff rather than like yeah and anthropogenic so sort of like um pollution essentially because that's not really being accounted for by the ecosystems. Yeah, so Fiona was talking about like um, folklore and indigenous knowledge and it's really interesting because in, you know, the UK and the British Isles, we do actually have quite a lot of folklore. And I did, um, I did a nature writing course with the Field Studies Council and um, we did like a whole week on um, folklore and like doing nature writing based on folklore. And I learned so much about the folklore of the country that I live in that I didn't know about like um hawthorn trees, I think it's hawthorn trees being, you know, fairy trees and being really um precious to fairies and um wanting them to be protected. So, you know, all all of us across the world have this folklore and mythology that's kind of based in nature that's been taken away from us really. And it's about like um reuniting us with that culture that links to nature. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I did a lot of kind of story, traditional like oral storytelling and stuff when I was younger and I'm kind of getting back into it now. But yeah, just the amount of folklore that we have in the UK and, you know, in all countries that's so like linked to land and, you know, and place and nature. And I feel like, you know, as there's such a disconnect with nature at the moment, I do feel like one of the ways to kind of bring that back is to have a kind of storied connection to it. So obviously, like, you know, knowing the science and knowing that it's got the ecosystem services and stuff is important but also kind of on a, on a like deeper level if you're like okay this has this folklore connection or I kind of know this story about this particular species of tree about hawthorn trees it just kind of you connect to it in a different way and it kind of makes you feel like closer to it um so yeah a lot of the time those stories like originated from people that were just trying to survive so it's a really good way of education as well because it's a lot of the songs and poems and literature that came about was just from people that were trying to forage and literally fight for their lives and teach their children don't eat that type of mushroom or don't forage in that type of area um, and it teaches us a lot about nature so by excluding it from literature and by not including it in the conversation we miss out on huge and vital parts of um, things that do need to be protected or at least included so it's kind of mind-blowing when they don't even consider it or they don't consider going to the locals and asking them about that area um if you're going to build a house in an area you'd want to know oh my god there's a dog look at the dog so sorry. sorry i get so easily distracted um if you're going to build a house in a certain area you'd want to know everything you could about that area before you did anything and but yet when it comes to our planet we don't have the sort of same mind like mindset you're going to know more about the ecosystems and the area you want to protect if you speak to local people about it because they'll have the best knowledge because they live there they've always lived there um they're indigenous to that area and is the dog gone 
no, he's there. Um, so it's just a, it's the best way, I think, of getting like at least the foundational knowledge before moving forward. And uh, we just haven't really for a long time included it. And it's almost been like scoffed or laughed at to like discuss it with those types of people, like with different groups of people that live there. And then we wonder why we have things like ecosystems collapsing. It's because you don't have any baseline knowledge of that area. You've just gone into there thinking that you don't know everything when you, you don't. So hey, do we have indigenous like people in the UK or sorry, in Europe even? And the other point was, uh, again, I mentioned Gaia theory earlier, which is something I really relate to at the moment with my studies. I find it super helpful to relate the sort of environmental science and the ecology stuff to my like my systems as a person and that is it's like almost fundamental to my learning and my interest in what i'm learning so i, I can relate to the folklore stuff in that sense yeah it's, it's super important to me okay that was incredible guys it just carried on going which was great it's exactly what we want to see and hear um and you all made some very incredible points about a whole range of topics so i hope that was equally as beneficial to you guys um as it is obviously going to be for us as well because you know um at the fsc we really want youth voices in what we provide as well so um anna sharing the um folklore courses is amazing to hear because they are something that we do provide so knowing that young people are interested in them is a great thing for us as well um but if anyone else has anything else to say then of course you can still make your points right now um but kind of felt like we've come to a bit of a natural close there as well but yes mm -hmm. thank you everybody for coming um it's been really interesting to hear all your views and we hope to see you all at another event soon <laughs>